Jesus is our example of what to always do. As a Christian, you are a follower of Christ. Sometimes we get a little bit confused and we start following other Christians, and other Christians will help us on the journey. But our main focus is to keep our eyes on Jesus. How many know that people will disappoint you sometimes? People will lead you away. If you say, I'm going to be a Christian until the first time someone disappoints me, you might only go for six or seven days. But if you keep your eyes on Jesus, he will never disappoint you. And that's my focus today is to look at the person of Jesus and his prayer life. If you make a copy of something and then make a copy of the copy and a copy of the copy of the copy, before long you can't read it, right? So you go back to the original. Jesus is the original. He's the one we serve. He's the one we keep our eyes on all the time. So turn with me in your copy of God's word, whether it's on your phone, on an app, or you brought the Bible with you today. The scriptures will be on the screen as well. To Luke chapter you, I am well pleased. What I want to point out from this scripture is that when we pray, we want to believe that heaven will open over that territory. As I was standing in Grant Beach Park yesterday, I sensed this park that I kind of worked out of last summer. When you pray, I want you to believe that God is going to open heaven over the territory. God needs to open heaven over Hope House and over Hannah's home, over your family, over your extended family. Pray for God to open heaven over Freedom City Church. There's an interesting factor in this passage of scripture that's for somebody today. Prayer is talking to God and hearing from God. And when we stop to let God speak to us, rarely does he do it in an audible form, but he'll give you a thought or an impression that's in line with the word of God and the will of God, and we get to know the voice of God. And sometimes when you stop to listen to the voice of God, maybe with your own influence or what you've been through, it's always negative. Try harder, do better, stop doing that. But I want to tell you, God has an affirming voice. He wants to celebrate you. He wants to compliment you, and he wants to say to you, just like he said to Jesus, you are my son whom I love. You are my daughter whom I love, and you I am well pleased. I want to take a moment right now in this service just to pause, and I want to encourage you, would you listen for the compliment of God to you this morning? You might say, well, I messed up as late as last night. I'm not doing things right. God doesn't have anything good to say about me. Yes, he does. The Lord wants to say, you are my chosen daughter and I love you. You are my son and I love you. The Lord wants to say to you, look at you. You showed up at church this morning. Look at you. You're five days sober. Look at you. You're making good choices. Look at you. You're running with a better crowd. God has a compliment for you this morning. Could we pause just a moment and would you listen to the voice of the Lord compliment you? Let's pray. Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your voice, that still, still, that still small voice that speaks to us what you think of us. And God, we know this morning that you're saying, Well done, my good and faithful servant. I love that you worked so hard yesterday at the outreach. I love that you have a history of sobriety. I love that you're sharing your testimony with other people. I love that you're planting a new church. I love that you're in church this morning. You're doing the right thing. God loves you. Amen. So we get from this example here, Jesus' prayer that models the affirming voice of the heavenly Father. Let's turn to chapter 5, verse 16. Chapter 5, verse 16 says this, But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. This was Jesus' pattern. It was his habit. He didn't do it just once in a while, but his lifestyle was he intentionally pulled away and spent time in prayer. He often withdrew to prayer. Now, Luke is one of the four Gospels, and name with me the other Gospels. The Gospels in the Bible are Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. These are four stories written by four different men for which the book was named 
And they're written to four different audiences as well, too. Matthew wrote to the Jews, Mark to the Gentiles, Luke wrote to the Greeks, and John wrote to everybody. He said, God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And those four parallel gospels have overlapping stories sometimes, and then sometimes there's something that's unique just to that one gospel. So we see Jesus pulling away to pray in the book of Luke, but also he pulled away in uh, Mark chapter one, it says, rising up a great while before day, he, Jesus, went off into a solitude place and there he prayed. So this was the habit that, that Mark noticed and Luke noticed and everyone around him knew. Jesus' way was to, to go away and pray at different times. And so he sets that example for us. Then let's look at um, Luke chapter six, verse 12. The Bible says this, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them who he also designated as apostles. The example Jesus is giving us here is that when you have a big decision to make, don't do it just on what your friends tell you or what you think is a smart decision but spend some time cut out in prayer. Go away and seek the Lord and say, God, I'm about to make a big decision. I'm gonna buy this house, I'm gonna marry this girl, I'm gonna move to a new city, whatever that big decision is, and ask the Lord, what is your will? Jesus was going to choose his disciples and that choice impacts our lives today. It impacted all of eternity, who he picked. And it was important that he picked the people that his heavenly father wanted him to pick. And so I would challenge you this morning, what big decision is before you? Might you wanna carve out some time and go away and pray? I got born again at the same church that uh, eventually brought me on staff. I was raised up from within the house and we're doing that here at Freedom City Church. That's a great way to raise up ministry. It's not the only way, but it's a great way. That's the way I came into ministry. I studied distance because I had already gone to paralegal school, so I studied through Global University and Berean School of the Bible out of Springfield, Missouri here, like some of you guys are doing in the house. And so when I, when I was raised up um, in that church, I served as a youth pastor for 10 years in Youngstown, Ohio, where I had become a Christian. I got an opportunity to move away to Cleveland, Ohio, and be an associate pastor at another church. Well, I went for the interview and I came back and I wasn't real sure what God's will was. So I asked a friend if she would spend the night praying with me in the sanctuary because I was a little scared to be there by myself through the night. And I spent the night in prayer asking the Lord, is this your will? And praying through that. And you might think he gave me an answer right then on that night. He didn't. The answer came a couple days later, but he gave me a clear answer. That was the right decision. And I would not have wanted to miss that opportunity for anything in the world. There are times, friends, when you need to spend the night in prayer, when you need to go away for a couple days and really dig in because the decision is big. In the Assemblies of God, from as long as I can remember, the first full week of January has been dedicated to the week of prayer. We would have seven o'clock prayer meetings. Sometimes the sanctuary would be open 24 seven and people would sign up for hours to come by and pray. Whatever Assembly of God church I've been a part of, we have honored the week of prayer that first week. Well, I remember when I was in my late 20s, we were coming around to the week of prayer and I had been dating a young man for about two and a half years and we both decided we need to make a decision here of either moving on in another direction or getting engaged. So I said, why don't we fast and pray for that week, that first week of January and try to hear from God, what is God's will? So we both did, we agreed to do that, we fasted and prayed. At the end of the week, I got an answer very different than I was expecting. He was a, a good Christian, we were compatible, we were on a volleyball team together that had won the championship that year. Everything seemed like, oh, this should be right. But God had a different answer. He said to me, you can if you want, but I have a different plan for your life. You need to hear from God about the major decisions in your life like that. And second to accepting Jesus as savior, who you marry or if you marry is the second biggest decision that will impact your life and your ministry. So you need to hear from the Lord when you make those big decisions. 
Well, I can tell you at the time I was working at a law office and didn't see that full-time ministry was going to be a chance for me. About 60 days after that decision, God opened up the door. I got a call saying, hey, we want you to come join the staff at our church. We want to enroll you in a school. We want to help you. That was the beginning of full-time ministry for me. I don't think it would have happened if I had made that marriage choice. God has a will for you, and he wants to lead and direct you. And there are times you need to break away and dig in and say, God, what are you saying to me? How can I hear your voice? Well, let's turn now to chapter 9, verse 18. Chapter 9, verse 18. It says this, once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say I am? So what can we learn from this example of Jesus praying? Well, first of all, I think it's phenomenal here that he was praying in private while his disciples were with him. Have you ever been in a crowd and you know, I need to pray in the middle of this crowd? Maybe you're in a correctional institution right now and you can't get away to pray, you can't go away to pray, and you have people all around you, you can still privately talk to God in the middle of the crowd. As, as a youth pastor, I was on a uh, tour bus and we would tour in the summer times and go from church to church ministering and doing drama and choir music. We were together 24 seven with a group of about 40 teenagers and the sponsors who were with them. You couldn't get away, but you could pray in the midst of the crowd. There are times that you're going to find yourself in the midst of a crowd, but God wants you to be praying alone. So don't think that you have to be alone in order to get alone with God. Jesus shows us an, a good example here of praying in private while his disciples were with him. The other item that it looks at here in this next passage, let's look just a few pages, just a few verses down to chapter 9, verse 18, or I'm sorry, chapter 9, verse 28. Chapter 9, verse 28 says, about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, James, and John with him and went onto a mountain to pray. While he was there, they had an, an incredible experience called the transfiguration. What I want to point out to you from this passage here is that Jesus took other people with him to pray. He went alone and prayed sometimes. In this scenario, he took Peter, James, and John, and he went together. Friends, there is power in agreement. Just like we did here across the altar this morning, several of you came forward to say, join me in prayer, pray with me about this. There is power in praying together with other Christians in agreement. And Jesus took three of his disciples with him to pray. Maybe your prayer life is strong. Let me encourage you to take someone on the left, someone on the right, somebody that's younger in the faith, and bring them along in your prayer life as well too. Most of what I learned about prayer was by someone else who taught me, someone who set the example. Somebody else who said, why don't you come along and join me in prayer? I remember when I was a, a young pastor, uh, our staff was going away to a, a retreat of some sort, and there was a widow missionary who wanted to room with me because she was single too and, and wanted to share a room. In the middle of the night, about 4 a.m., I woke up in my bed and I saw that she had gotten out of her bed and she had knelt down in the chair in our room. And at 4 a.m., she was there kneeling in prayer and stayed on her knees in prayer until the sun came up. I rolled over and went back to sleep, but that forever made an impact on my mind of, wow, that's what prayer warriors do. That's what missionaries do. That's incredible. And she challenged me to pray. Other people in my life that have challenged me to pray, hear it, let me just stop to say this. It's the Holy Spirit that puts joy in our lives, even when the circumstances around us might not be ideal. You can be in a sense these things from the wise and learned and reveal them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. Verse 22 says, all things have been committed to me by my father self right out of depression. Sometimes you can thank yourself to a better way of thinking. Sometimes your heart of gratitude can lift you up to a place where you are feeling low and dark and all of a sudden everything changes. Why? Just because that happened and allow me to get this, then amen. God doesn't need us to tell him what to do. 
He needs us to surrender our will to him and let him work in the situation the way that God wants to work. That's what was happening in this passage. And Jesus said to the Heavenly Father, I thank you for the way that you're working. And his heart was full of gratitude. Well, let's look across the page at Luke chapter 11, verse 1. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. That's as far as we're going to read in that passage, but many of you might know who are reading the Bible that that was the beginning of what we know as the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus went on to give a model of a prayer. But I want to focus with you about this moment that happened before Jesus gave that model. We don't know in this passage if Jesus was praying loudly or whispering very soft. We don't know if Jesus was praying on his knees, kneeling, or if he was pacing back and forth like some of us like to do. We don't know. It doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us if he was um, praying a, a long prayer or a brief prayer. But what we do know from this passage, it created an appetite in their lives. For the last year since moving here to Springfield from Cleveland, Ohio, I've had the privilege of working on a book that's going to come out in just a couple of days. I've been writing the book for the last year, but I've been experiencing the book for the last decade, several decades, the last four decades, in fact. And my book is entitled Leveling the praying field. And it's a book to help people find an on-ramp of how they can pray too. The premise of the book is that prayer is not for the specialist. It's not just for the intercessor or the prayer warrior, but it's for every believer. The premise of the book is that prayer is to every Christian what breathing is to our physical bodies. Where you're sitting right now, just take a deep breath in, would you? And exhale. Take another breath in and exhale. Don't you love breathing? (laughs) Your body really benefits from your breathing. Well, similarly, your soul benefits from you praying. And whether you're a five-year-old kid or a 90-year-old person, whether you have a PhD or a fifth-grade education, God wants to hear from us all, and he wants to speak to us all. And so the premise of the book is helping people be able to do that more and more. Turn with me clear to the back of uh, Luke now to Luke chapter 22, if you would. And gave it to them saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus is modeling a prayer here that's a toggling back and forth between him talking to God and then talking to the guys he was hanging out with. I think that's a great model for us to follow. When you're with your friends, when you're with your family, you talk to them, but talk to God as well. Toggle back and forth and include him in that conversation. Sometimes you might even get an opportunity to say, hey, hey, would you mind if we prayed about that right now? And kind of include God in. He's like that unseen friend hanging back, waiting to be introduced to the conversation that you're a part of. If you'll watch for the opportunity and include him in. Jesus at the Lord's Supper here when he was breaking the bread and pouring the cup was talking to the Lord saying, Lord, we thank you for this bread. And then to his buddies, take and eat. And we can do that too. Lord, I thank you for this beautiful scenery out on this fishing boat today. And then you turn and talk to the people you're fishing with, right? Toggling back and forth, Jesus gave us that beautiful example. He also gives us this beautiful example of an attitude of gratitude. He was thankful. Jesus had a clue where he had been, the Garden of Gethsemane, and where he was going to the cross, but yet he was thankful in the middle of it all, and he said, Lord, we thank you. An attitude of gratitude. Well, let's flip over. We have just a couple more to go here. You're doing great. Chapter 22, verse 31, looking at the example of Jesus in his prayer life. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. What I have prayed, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Simon also was called Peter, Simon Peter, and you might remember that Peter denied Jesus three times. What Jesus observed about Simon Peter's life 
was that there was warfare all around him. Satan desired to sift him like wheat. Do you have a friend and you look at their life and you say, boy, Satan desires to sift her like wheat. She's being attacked in every direction. Well, the response Jesus did was he prayed for her. He prayed for him. We offer prayer when we see that Satan is, is coming in on someone and attacking them. When you see that there is a battle in your own life, reach out for prayer and seek the Lord to be able to get the prayer that you need when you see that it's Satan's desire to sift like wheat. What you see here in this passage, Simon Peter had this attack coming at him from the enemy, but Jesus prayed for him to never lose his faith. Now his behavior got outside of God, but he never lost faith. He came back and, and repented and restored his relationship with Jesus. Some of you, maybe, maybe even as recent as in the last 24 hours, you would say, my, my behavior has not aligned with my Christian faith, but your faith in Jesus is still alive in there. And so I wanna encourage you today to separate behavior from belief. Realize that when your behavior is wrong, come back to Jesus, repent, turn away. Here's what repentance means. It means I'm walking in this direction in my behavior and I turn and I walk the other direction in behavior. And so when we repent, we turn and go the other direction. That's our behavior. Your relationship with you and he wants to forgive you of anything you have by and he, he might want to build, he might want to just get in your hair a little bit. If you allow him to build a nest, that's, that's yielding to the temptation, but you can shoo him right out of there, right? And so temptation will come your way. Just don't allow it to get a grip on you to where you yield to that temptation. And so Jesus prayed here that this temptation would be gone. In fact, that's a part of the Lord's prayer, isn't it? Lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What a great prayer. Pray that for yourself and your friends all the time. Back to the scripture, verse 40. Once reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. Verse 41, he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. Jesus directed his disciples to pray. He, he told them what to do, and he's telling us to do that. He's not saying, if you feel like it, talk to me once in a while, but he's directing us, you've got to pray. It's what keeps us going spiritually. He prayed all the time. He prayed against temptation. He prayed, and then it says that he was in anguish, so he quit? No. He was in anguish, so he prayed a little bit more. When you get to a place where you feel like you want to give up, don't give up, but just press in a little bit more and talk to God a little bit more and press in, press in, press in. So here's the big idea about this morning's sermon. Maybe you'll be with someone later today and they'll say, what'd the pastor preach about today? Here's the big idea. The big idea is this. God wants to talk to you and hear from you. God's son Jesus shows us his example in, of prayer throughout the book of Luke. And that's what we're looking at today, that we would follow the example of Jesus throughout the book of Luke of how he prayed. And you know that he wants to talk to you and hear from you on a regular basis. It doesn't matter how long you've known the Lord. It doesn't matter how polished your prayers are. He longs because you're his son, you're his daughter, to hear from you, and he wants to speak to you as well.